I was a teenaged evangelist. I know for some of you that's scarier than if I had said I was a teenaged werewolf. <laughs> but I was. I was a teenaged evangelist, more specifically, a street evangelist. One summer, back in the late 60s, I was part of a group of high school and college kids who went out every night to witness to their faith. We would gather first at the beachside cottage of a youth pastor named Dick and hear from him a word of encouragement. Then we would pray that God would lead us to those who needed to hear the good news on that particular night. After that, we fanned out in pairs, walking up and down the boardwalk at Hampton Beach, looking for souls who seemed to be in need of a message of salvation. And when we had identified such a person, when we felt we were being nudged by the Spirit in a particular direction, we would walk up to them and ask if they knew about Jesus. As I look back on that summer, over 45 years ago now, I am both dismayed and impressed. I am dismayed about the nature of my theological understandings back then, so simplistic, so naive, so unaware of the broadness of God's love and grace. I assumed back then if someone wasn't able to say Jesus was their personal Lord and Savior, they were doomed, and it was my job to save them from perdition. But looking back, I am also impressed. Impressed by that pimply-faced young man who had the courage of his convictions. Today, I can't imagine walking up to a complete stranger and asking about their spiritual health and well-being. Even under the protection of my professional role and title, I am sometimes hesitant to speak with people about such matters. Yet, for all of that, I firmly believe that one's relationship to God is at the very core of life. I wonder how many of you feel the same way. And you don't even have the cover of being a preacher. I wonder how many of you feel awkward, embarrassed, uncomfortable talking about matters of faith. I saw a cartoon the other day that speaks to many of us, I'm sure. Two men are standing at a bus stop in the suburbs somewhere. One of them is wearing a business suit. He carries an attache case. The other is dressed in a t-shirt and jeans. On his t-shirt it says, let's talk about Jesus. The caption reads, it guarantees me an entire seat to myself on the bus. Yes, we are often uncomfortable talking about religion. But as Professor Michael Murray points out, it's not all talk of religion that makes us squirm. He writes, it's okay to speak of religion and religious adherence from a safe distance, treating them or it as a historical phenomenon or a sociocultural influence, it's something altogether different, he says, to discuss religious commitments that we own. That is the sort of religion and religious talk that troubles us. And he's right. We're okay talking about the beliefs of ancient Mayans or the impact of religious diversity on American society, but when it comes to talking about our own personal beliefs and practices, many, if not most of us, hem and haw 
and quickly try to change the subject. I suspect there are many reasons why we do that. For some of us, testifying to our own faith smacks of a fundamentalist approach to religion. And God forbid anyone mistake us as one of those kind of people. For others, our hesitancy is rooted in a belief that religion is a private matter. It's nobody's business what I believe, and it's none of mine what convictions you may hold. Some folks don't speak about their faith because they feel inadequate to the task. They aren't up to it. That's the job of ministers and rabbis and priests, they say, not a mere layperson like me. I have no business talking about those things. What do I know? But listen, friends. If people make the assumption that if someone talks about their faith, they must be a fundamentalist, if that's the assumption people make, then we have no one to blame but ourselves. If the only people who talk about their faith are those who hold literalist, fundamentalist beliefs, then it makes perfect sense that people will make such an assumption. And while I agree that one's religious views are deeply personal, I remind you there's a significant difference between something being personal and something being private. I don't know about you, but I talk about personal preferences all the time, ad nauseum. <laughs> my favorite movies, my favorite music, my favorite authors, my favorite restaurants. It's a personal matter whether I like Jacaranda better than Traders, but it's not private. And while it's true, clergy do have a special obligation to speak about religious convictions and beliefs. Deb and I do have that obligation. At least for Christians of our persuasion, we're not the only ones authorized to do that. In fact, our gospel reading from Matthew is all about the fact that Jesus authorizes his followers to do exactly that. Go, he says, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all that I've commanded you. Indeed, at baptism or confirmation, it is one of the vows that you took, one of the promises that you made. Candidates are asked, do you promise to witness to the work and word of Jesus Christ as best as you are able. Part of the obligation we take on at baptism is to bear witness to our faith, to bear witness to the good news. Now, let's be clear. This doesn't mean that you all need to go out and become street evangelists. Heaven forbid. It doesn't mean you need to buttonhole complete strangers and share the plan of salvation, whatever that may be. Nor do you need to be talking about Jesus nonstop. Little Billy comes home from Sunday school. His mother asks him if he enjoyed his class. Oh, it was great, Mom. Our teacher is Jesus' grandmother. <laughs> Mrs. Jones, says his mother. She's not his grandmother. What makes you say that? Well, she must be his grandmother. Jesus is all she ever talks about. <laughs> you don't need to be Mrs. Jones. You don't need to add Jesus to your list of grandchildren. You don't need to set up a 529 account for him or carry his picture in your wallet. But you do need to be willing to mention his name once in a while and not just when you smash your thumb with a hammer. 
you need to find ways to feel comfortable talking about your God, your faith, and your church. All across the nation, there is a growing concern in mainline churches like our own about the decline in church membership, a decline that's not experienced in the same way in fundamentalist and evangelical churches. While there are a variety of reasons for that, one of the most significant is the simple fact that folks in evangelical and fundamentalist churches are much more willing to talk about their religious convictions than most of us are. They're more open to inviting their friends and neighbors and families to their churches. If you don't share the message, no one's ever going to hear it. A New Yorker cartoon illustrates, a group of business persons are gathered in a boardroom. A presentation is being made. Up front, there is a graph with a steeply declining line. The dip in sales, says the presenter, the dip in sales seems to coincide with the decision to eliminate the sales staff. You got to talk about it for people to hear it. So how can you keep your baptismal vow? How can you witness to the work and word of Jesus Christ? No doubt there are many ways to do that. Here are a few suggestions. Don't be afraid to tell your story. Why do you believe in God? How's that helped you in your life? Why is church important to you? What does this church, if you're a member of it, or an associate member, or a friend, why does this church in particular mean something to you? There are often openings in conversations where it's perfectly natural to speak of your faith. You just need to be willing to do so. You don't have to present it as, my religion is right and yours is wrong. You don't have to suggest that your way is the only way. In fact, you can preface any such storytelling with something like, well, this is what's worked for me. This is what's really been helpful for me. This is what's been meaningful for me. It doesn't work for everybody. It may not be helpful for you. But maybe it would be, so let me tell you about it. And don't be afraid to label your actions. When you do something because you feel, as a follower of Jesus, as a Christian, it's the right thing to do, don't be afraid to say so. You don't have to come off sounding holier than thou, but saying, I'm working at the food pantry because Jesus said we're supposed to feed the poor. Or if that's too threatening, it's because it's something my church feels is important for us to do. Take care of the needy. That's not bragging or making yourself out as somebody who's better than other people. It's simply witnessing to the faith you follow. I'll never again be a street evangelist. You can be sure of that. My theology and my methods have both changed dramatically over the years. But I hope and pray that I might always have the courage the conviction, and the willingness to bear witness that motivated that pimply kid so long ago. I pray that courage for you as well. Amen.
Sisters and brothers, I don't know about you, but it always rubs me the wrong way when the media makes assumptions about what it means to be a Christian. They make those assumptions largely because we are so quiet about our understandings. This week, I invite you to seriously consider how you keep this vow to witness to the work and word of Jesus Christ. How do you keep this baptismal promise, which is so fundamental to our health and well-being as a people, as a congregation? To make your work a little easier, the insert we enclosed about Bluegrass Sunday is designed to be handed off to a friend or a neighbor. Invite them to come and join us next Sunday for a service that we guarantee you'll have your feet popping and your hands snapping and you'll just really enjoy it and so will they. You, sisters and brothers, you, you are the most effective people when it comes to sharing the good news about God and about this church. It is in your hands. Might you wisely take up the responsibility. And remember this. We are promised no matter where we go or what we do, Christ is always with us, even to the end of the age. Amen.